we're going to have our final presentation of the afternoon uh, now, and I'm really pleased to be able to introduce this speaker. Uh, so uh, Bob Doherty did his degree and PhD at Strathclyde University and joined ICI Zeneca in 1988, where he worked on the structure and crystallization of dyes, pigments, biocides, electrophotographic agents, agrochemicals and pharmaceuticals. He joined Pfizer in 1999 as head of material sciences. He retired from his role as strategic lead for digital design at Pfizer in December 2020. He holds a visiting professorship at Leeds University and is a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry. Throughout his career, he's been fortunate to work at the Industrial Academic Interface with numerous partners to help create and guide a range of research projects and has published over 75 journal papers and book chapters. His research interests are focused on the structural and simulation aspects of the assembly of molecules to crystals, crystals to particles and particles to products in order to support a community vision towards an unprecedented digital perspective of the journey from molecule to medicine. This is the topic of his talk this afternoon entitled Digitally Enabled Workflows, Accelerating the Molecules to Materials to Product Journey. Bob, over to you. Thank you, Rob, and, and good afternoon, everyone. It's a great, great pleasure to be here. Um, I'd like to thank the organisers for the um, kind invitation to speak. And as um, Rob mentioned, what I'm interested in is trying to figure out how you fuse the sort of material sciences workflows into a digital architecture. And that's really going to be the the, the theme of the presentation today. And when I was asked to give the talk, I started to think a little bit about the um, presentation I gave at the CSD's um, 50th celebration. And I thought a little bit about the journey of molecules to crystals, to particles, to products that I think Susan captured so nicely on her second to last slide. I thought a little bit about that journey from 2015 to today, and today being um, signified by the, the new CCDC um, logo on the right hand side of the slide. And as we go through that journey, we're going to hear some input from, from Pfizer and um, from Leeds, from the ADOPT project, and from NMIP. And hopefully, that'll give you a little sense of how we're starting to see the emergence of these digital tools into a digital tapestry. So just to give you a little sense of the presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about the importance of digital design to our vision. I'm going to talk a little bit about how our vision has been has been shaped by other other sectors and, and the ecosystem. I'm going to give some very quick vignettes, really quick snapshots of how I see digital tools starting to emerge in a, in a workflow environment with properties, solid form, stability, particles, and sticking. I'm then going to give a little bit of an um, outlook towards the future and talk about the ISCF Wave 3 engagement and the digital design roadmap and finish with some announcements. I think it's really important to, to acknowledge that, that this presentation has really been shaped by presentations and discussions um, from, from the NATO Summer School in 2015 through the ADOPT dissemination event in London. Um, the MMIP conference that we held at Sandwich, and, and, and informed a lot by the MMIP technology strategy and how you think about integrating your cutting edge materials, sciences, workflows, and uh, product realization processes. And most recently, from um, European Materials Modeling Council, the EMMC white paper on gaps and obstacles in materials modeling. And, and references to that are, are in the presentation. If you can So um, this is an old slide um, in terms of highlighting the importance of material sciences, but I think it's a it's an impactful one. It's one that a number of people have tweaked and shaped over many years, including Paul Meenan, who I think is on, on the call. It really highlights the importance of solid state chemistry, and whether it's the internal structure at the heart of the crystal or the surface chemistry, um, that can affect um, the product realization process, both in terms of how it's delivered, um, the product quality, and the manufacturing efficiency. And clearly, through um, a few of the speakers this morning, uh, this afternoon, so you've heard a little bit around you know, how, how co crystals can engineer different dissolution profiles and solubility profiles, different thermal stability, and of course, the importance of, of informatics and realizing that. But as we go through the workflows, hopefully, you'll start to see 
some of those starting to um, emerge. And actually, these arrows really being able to be articulated from the crystal structure um, that we heard about in the second talk. And so when I think a little bit about um, material sciences workflows, I suppose I, I view it in two different ways. If I think about it, when I used to work in material sciences and, and, and help move that organisation forward, I think a little bit about the history um, in terms of moving from sort of delivering routine characterisation of drug substance and drug product through developing state-of-the-art state of characterisation tools through to developing robotic systems, all the way forward to thinking a little bit about how you then start to connect from the form up towards the formulation. So small scale materials testing like compaction simulators, flow and testers. I'm thinking a little bit about surface characterization and the importance of atomic force microscopy. So start to think a little bit about not just the form, but the formulation, and also a little bit about how you actually arrive at the form to so the crystallization process. So the form, formulation, and formation are really important. And if we think about that journey um, um, from an experimental perspective, we also need to think a little bit about that from a digital design perspective. And here we start to think a little bit, building on the presentations um, earlier this afternoon around crystal structure production and solid form informatics, to think a little bit about you know, how do you think about API attributes at the drug substance, drug product interface, how do you think about um, collapsing all this information into a digitally enabled workflow at the heart of product realization? And really, I think that's our, our digital design vision. Um, it's really sort of moving towards this unprecedented structural perspective of product design. It's why I was fascinated um, around how we um, are routinely solving crystal structures now and starting to move move towards that being at the heart of product design. Let me think a little bit about the academic industry interface. And indeed, we can't do all of this stuff by ourselves in industry. We need to foster a, a scientific support ecosystem that complements our internal activities. And ultimately, we're moving towards this digital definition of drug product and process design for both API and, and the product itself. And, and, and building that within a sort of digital framework. And, and we believe, I think, that by bringing all this together inside some digital framework, we will sort of revolutionize, revolutionize that product and realization in terms of speed and quality. And if you think about that, molecules make crystals, make particles, make products. The major workflows that we want to make sure that we're able to influence and optimize are helping select the right molecule the discovery interface, design the right product with the patient perspective in mind, and make sure that that manufacturing process can be optimized as we move forward in, in, in through our organization. So select the right molecule, design the right product, optimize the manufacturing processes. And I did say earlier on, I would talk a little bit about how um, our digital design vision is being influenced by other sectors and by um, uh, the ecosystem. And I picked on, on three areas to just talk a little bit about. So obviously the NASA 2040 vision introduces this concept of the digital tapestry, which I think is really elegant. You see these nine threads coming together and start to think a little bit about how you integrate data and models and verification and validation. So that's a really important thread for us to, to sort of think a lot about as we move forward with the community. Secondly, there's a very extensive um, UK report on um, you know, Industry 4.0 and the Made Smarter report really does capture the sort of technologies and the opportunity space around both the pharma sector and, 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 other, and other areas. And start to think a little bit about you know, how you can bring the threads into that framework. And then, of course, there's some really impactful work by the European Materials Modeling Council. And they've talked about the importance of translational and number of occasions. And actually, I think this is a really important part where you figure out how do you make sure that people are able to access the tools, and use the tools with confidence, and think a little bit about how that can be operated at the industrial academic interface. 
So as we go through the rest of the presentation, think a lot about, about the four T's, think about the tapestry, think about the specific technology, and think about translation and training. And so now I'm going to start with the, the, the vignettes and some of the stories, and I'm really going to focus a lot of it on the ADOPT project. And the reason I pick on the ADOPT project is it was the coming together of both industry, um, research organisations, and a number of um, small medium enterprises, and you can see the, the, um, the, the names there. Um, and it was one of the um, flagship projects from MMIP a number of years ago. Um, and Ian McCubbin was the chair at the time. He talked a lot about, about digital design, and I think he captured it very, very nicely in this little, um, this little thread here. It creates virtual medicine manufacturing systems to make sure they're effective and efficient before creating them in the real world. And that's a, a, a vision that we should think about, and it's a vision we should think about in terms of how do we use the structural data that we've been talking about this afternoon, the material sciences, emerges from those structures and how do we fuse those in a way that we can actually go back in thinking about the API manufacture we can start think a little bit about the formulation and how the particles and solid state structure impacts that and we can also think a lot about the journey of that information towards the product performance in the patient and so start to think a little bit about those as it was an important goal of adopt and what I've got is half a dozen little vignettes that are picked that I think were catalyzed by by the adopt project And so the first project actually sort of links very nicely to, to the second talk this afternoon. It talks a little bit about the um, importance of bringing together um, structural information, both from within industry and within the database itself. And so one of the outputs of the ADOPT project was, was the creation of the CSD drug subset. Um, we've already seen some information on that and comparing this um, complex Venn diagram with the GSK database. And we can also see as well as the sort of, you know, construct and create, um, Matt and Andy did a fantastic job of then sort of bringing together an industry perspective on, on you know, let's look at the subset and look at hydrogen bond donors and acceptors and compare um, Pfizer and, and AZ data with respect to that. And of course, you've seen some GSK data this afternoon already. And what I think it highlights is, is some of the comments and some of the questions that came forward around how can the how can the Cambridge structural database and the CSD be a sort of data trust? And Kevin Back um, created this nice slide which he presented in Paris a few years ago around how you go from the Cambridge structural database down to organic, down to drug subset, and then to specific um, company databases. And how can you use that to both create models and then refine and optimize the models so they're highly relevant for the chemistries in, in individual companies that are across companies. So this, this idea of the, the, the data trust is an interesting um, an interesting concept. But a really nice paper from, from, from Matt and Andy. Um, the second vignette I want to talk a lot about is um, our interest in, in solubility. And um, Clementina Pincheva and Tiffany Lai did a really nice job in trying to build some machine learning models um, to actually explore an understanding of the of the role of the lattice energy versus the solvation energy in deconstructing um, uh, low solubility. So if you look at the picture on the top right hand side, you can see a, an attempt to collapse lots of academic data and lots of industry data in a, a sort of four box grid where solubility is either limited by solvation or packing or a combination of both. So we were fascinated by the idea of being able to estimate the lattice energy strength um, from um, and crystal structures and also from building a, a QSPR model that allowed us to use it at the co-discovery interface. And so what we did was um, develop various machine learning models to try and optimize that. You can see the example here where we looked at um, some of the anhydrous materials in the Pfizer database, a couple of thousand crystal structures that we looked at and we built a model and then we applied that model to you know, a part of the database that I'd never seen and looked at the predictability of that. And that's been an interesting, an interesting exercise as we start to explore the importance of data and data sets and exploring models and making comparisons. And indeed, um, in the paper, we also tried to compare 
from the small molecule data sets that have been published and, and, and lats benefit estimation methods evaluated using those and compare that to the Pfizer database and describe the difference that we see between um, the machine learning models applied to those different data sets. And so that's our starting of this journey of trying to combine crystallography simulations and, and, and data sciences. Um, 20 years ago, there was a fantastic paper published by my colleagues at um, Abbott on, on Norvia. And very recently, um, to celebrate the 20th anniversary of that, uh, a paper was pulled together by um, Kevin Roberts and Ian and Tom Turner at Leeds and some of the colleagues at Abbey. And I really like this paper because it starts to think a little bit about what is the workflow going to look like? So how do I go through the three stages, molecular properties, solid state properties, surface and particle properties, and how do I start to think a little bit about um, how a previous example would have weaved through that workflow and what would be um, similar and or different now? So it's really nice to see, see that wonderful paper from 20 years ago revisited with a, um, a sort of crystallographic simulation and perspective on it. And you can see some examples of what um, Ian and Tom and others have tried to do um, on the left hand side, attempting to deconstruct the lattice energy um, for the two polymorphs and collapse it onto the various parts of the molecule and trying to understand what's going on there. You can start to see the complexity in that picture already. We're starting to describe the rough contribution of each of the groups to lattice energy and also trying to describe the differences. So it's actually a fascinating figure uh, to spend a bit of time in. And, and look at. And of course, what Ian and Tom and others tried to do as well is look at the two crystalline um, particles that come out of um, Form 1 and Form 2 and look at the different surface chemistries. And again, trying to find intuitive, easy to access ways of describing um, the crystallography as it manifests itself as surfaces is going to be an important part of um, our journey moving forward as a community. So again, a lovely, um, a lovely um, little vignette of the, the Norvia story there. Um, building on the, the importance of um, physical and chemical stability, um, Pat Basford and Aurora did a really nice um, piece of work looking at fluconazole and what I, what I really like about this paper um, is, is its classical material sciences from a pharmaceutical perspective. So there's PXRD information, there's DSC information, there's DVS, there's SEM in there. There's also you know, studies determining critical water activity and, and some very elegant stability studies that you can see on the, on the left hand side, both covering sort of the impact of humidity, the impact of seeding in, in ground materials and, and milling. And it's really fascinating to see that fantastic work um, brought together. But what's really adding to the richness of the paper is building on an understanding of how the molecular conformation in the three anhydrous polymorphs um, compares to the, the monohydrate, and indeed um, how the packing patterns of um, the different forms um, compared to the monohydrate and can you see how the solid state phase transformation might actually start to take place and you can see at the top of this picture the comparison of the monohydrate conformation with a c and b and at the bottom of the, the slide some packing information um, showing some of the similarities and differences and again have a look at this paper because um solid state stability is one of those areas where there's a great challenge i think remains for us in terms of being able to explain and um, the rates of conversion uh, and this is a very nice um, example where you try to bring classical experimental workflows and add to the, to the richness of that using crystallographic information. Um, Susan hinted about um, particle informatics and I think it was one of the um, really nice efforts from um, um, Andy Maloney, Matt, um, Rob Hammond and Jonathan Pickering, um, guided by, by, by Kevin Roberts and others at the University of Leeds. What they were really interested in trying to do is develop a 
practical informatics workflow that complements the solid form informatics workflow that's been so successful um, was mentioned by um, a number of people today. And what you can see is this idea of being able to try and quickly get to the surface chemistry through easy to use tools and technologies. And you can see um, on the left hand side, the 110 face of Lamotrigine with different displays that are you know, intuitive and easy to get to and help. And perhaps the non-experts in crystallography really start to see how the molecular features are manifesting themselves on the different surfaces. And then some examples of, of what can be done. So that was figure eight and figure nine is, is, is um, an example of adding probe molecules to those to different crystal surfaces and looking at the binding energies and comparing that to the binding energies of lamotrigine itself and a number of impurities in the process. And so you can start to see tools and technologies which aren't perfect yet, but are starting to show how you may engage with a crystallization scientist or, or, or a formulator. I think what's really interesting in, in, in this paper and fascinating, of course, was, was the input from, from Kendall Pat um, at GSK. So Kendall mentioned in the acknowledgements, but it was really fascinating to have, when we're presenting some of the adopt output, Kendall in the audience, and he started to talk a lot about, about the legacy lamotrigine formulation and started to show how by engaging with that community, you start to see how they would use tools and technologies and how you could address some of the challenges with, you know, the inverted commas and new workflows. And so there's a really nice example of starting to build that bridge with the formulation community. And we'll hear a little bit more um, about some of the work Kendall's been doing in a few seconds. And of course, we talk a lot about molecules coming out of discovery and coming into design of the product, but actually there's been a quite a few um, examples recently in the literature around actually manufacturing colleagues starting to embrace um, some of these tools and technologies and that's why I picked um, this paper. So Debbie Hooper and Fiona Clark work in the manufacturing support organisation and they've been interested in how they can build in crystallographic technologies and tools that we use so often to think a little bit about you know how you provide manufacturing support for legacy products or perhaps um, um, some of the tools and technologies haven't been applied because they've been in manufacturing for a long time and they've been developing um, a sticking test a small scale sticking test and what debbie was able to publish um, was an example of what i'd be profound of starting to engineer the crystal shape and size distribution and um, develop the small scale test and then on top of that try and take an understanding of the crystallography um, of the different faces and start to wrap that into the storyboard around sticking and so the paper is, is cited here but if you want to see it applied to um, you know a, a real product uh, hear about it applied to a real product the lovely article in the European Pharmaceutical Review around how you take the concepts introduced in the paper and apply that to a real manufacturing process and there's some work ongoing around how you deconvolute and API aspects process um, and some of the accepting aspects and the, the sticking propensity for a, a product and that's a very um, nice example that's cited there in the, in the paper. So those are the little vignettes that I talked about and um, the final part of the presentation we're just going to start and look a little bit towards the future. Um, so of course ADOPT was a, was a given project, it, it, it um, came to an end, but we start to think a little bit about how you continue to build the momentum here and we had this concept of a digital design accelerator roadmap. So what we have in um, the left hand side is the industrial strategy challenge fund challenges um, described, you know, transforming the product life cycle creating and exploiting data and modeling products and processes, connecting and, and, and modifying versatile supply chains. And then of course, on the right hand side, what you've got is the research outcomes, you know, halving the time from concept product definition to production, you know, increasing efficiency of production, digital twins being utilized. Um, and so what we did was think about those two sides and then say, well, what is it that we want to do as a pharmaceutical community? A number of colleagues from different companies got together and started thinking about what would be um, 
a roadmap that people could respond to, then start to build in a project proposal to move things forward. And so you can see a little bit here around API to drug product connectivity as a theme, and drug product processing digital twins. And um, how do we uh, think about um, complex molecule development? And then think a little bit about moving towards the product and the patient. What does sophisticated um, dosage form delivery look like, for example, multiple seculants? And how do you think about um, connecting some of these areas to the product performance? And of course, there are foundational aspects to that data science, machine learning, simulation platform, data trusts. And we were starting as a community to think a little bit about how we how we bring that, um, that roadmap to life. And of course, we've had a couple of um, successes since we started with that. So the first example, um, the first project is really the API drug product interface. And um, just to highlight um, the importance of this, if you go to this paper from Tysost and Marziano, you can start to see a formulator in Martin Tysost a crystallizer and even on Marciano start to think a little bit about how does the solid form and the particle engineering affect um, properties of API and then connect that to drug product attributes and how can you how can you think about um, engineering for those various aspects and then of course Kendall Pitt and, and, and Michael Lean and a few others start to think a little bit about the manufacturing classification system so understanding the manufacturing process they're starting to think backwards towards the API and, and how you actually make um, the materials. And so in some senses, what you can see now is um, those communities starting to come together and digital tools really reshaping that interface. So this is another project involving you know, academics, industry and, and small, medium companies. And it really starts to think a little bit about, um, you know, how does digital tools and how does crystallization information or crystal information sit at the heart of that API drug product interface and at the interface of manufacturing and development? And the second to last slide is um, a slide Alistair Florence um, gave me to use a number of months ago around um, creating a sort of EPSRC um, data center for, for medicines manufacture and this was a slide that was um I'll say um from a number of months ago it's fantastic news that it's been successful and been funded and the the links are are there for everybody to see so now you're starting to see some of those foundational aspects as well as those specific projects of the api drug product interface starting to emerge and thinking a little bit around how do you how do you um embrace digital medicines manufacturing and the research that needed to under, underpin that and transform it. So some great news both from project one and, and from this um, um, data centre that's, that's being funded. So just to finish, um, a final thought and then some acknowledgements. Um, Susan mentioned in her introduction the importance of sort of data inspired material design. I think that's absolutely spot on. So the picture at the bottom shows, you know, molecules make particles, make well, molecules make crystals, make particles, make products. And think a little bit about, you know, what's the tapestry that we need to put in place so that material sciences is at the heart of that journey? Where are the technologies that we need to invest in? How do we make sure we're able to translate from small, medium enterprises and companies into industry? And how do we make sure that we are we're educating colleagues so that they are early adopters of the tools and technologies and can actually broaden the application. And Kevin Bach in his Paris presentation used this phrase, so the application of digital tools fuses opportunities across workflows and across the three disciplines in the communities. And you think about the formation, the solid form and the formulation. And part of the journey I think now will be to reach back into the formation step and reach up into the formulation and product performance areas. So hopefully um, I've taken you from the CSD 50th celebration um, where we talked a little bit about this um, as a sort of future vision. We've given an update on where we've got to through the through the, the six vignettes and they, they show 
and reflect the emerging impact of, of digital tools fused with workflows. Um, this is a quote we've used a couple of times before in presentations. I think it's true um, that you know this celestial fire to help with the transformation is really now a combination of digital tools and high quality experimental information. And it does provide us with the opportunity of transforming how we think at the API drug product interface and at the development manufacturing interface. And to finish, um, thank you for your time today and, and, and to thank all the colleagues who have, who have contributed to this slide deck and whether they're partners from ADOPT, uh, old Pfizer colleagues, part of the MMIP community, some of the academic partners. I'd like to thank them for all their time and effort and, and thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thanks very much, Bob. That was a really interesting presentation. Um, I think it's, it's covered a lot of ground. Uh, there over the things that have happened in the last you know, five years and, and the background to some of that as well. Um, but I'll ask a, a quick question, if you don't mind, Bob, um, just to kick us off. What do you see as the biggest barriers to people adopting some of these things? Because you've shown some fantastic science and some really great rationalisation of events that have happened and some of the material science that's gone on in there with the likes of the Lamotrigine paper and, and your uh, kinetic stability of hydrates. What are the barriers to trying to get that embedded in, in more organisations uh, across the world, do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think this is one of the, the big questions around um, digital tools and simulations and, and data sciences. How do you move it from um, the realm of the, the, the talented expert into a broader deployment? And I, and I think that the, the sort of four areas when I think about it, make sure we've got the right infrastructure so that the computing access and the data access is easy and early um, for, for colleagues. Make sure we've got um, the right workflows in place. Make sure colleagues and the managers are thinking, how do you embed some of these um, lovely tools and technologies into the workflows so that they're instinctive? How do you then make sure um, the colleagues are trained um, to use the tools? And the training part, I think, is really quite important. Um, it's probably the gap that we we talk about um, when we see some of the funding mechanisms. And then the final part will be about um, you know, how do you make sure you're constantly investing in the new technology and, 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 and moving it forward. So I think those sort of you know, workflows, workforce, infrastructure, and, and the right scientific initiatives are probably the, the key. But for me, training colleagues is probably the next big step. Yeah, thanks. I think that. That makes a lot of sense to me to to get that education piece right, um, and then it, it should become clear to to all concerned the value of this kind of approach. Okay, um, well, thanks very much, Bob. Uh, as I say, a fantastic presentation, a great way to to round off this afternoon's proceedings.